rolling with the fat. I encourage you to get fat. What? All things the game of bowling. Helping bowlers. The hand collapses down. And I'm going to try to bowl the best I can. 1,000 subscribers. And I want to challenge you to get nothing. Tom Corbin. It's Jason Belmonte. Hey everybody, good Tuesday night to you. Welcome to Bowling with the Fat. A little earlier time for us tonight, but despite the, t- the time change, still uh, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story live on our YouTube channel. I always tell people when I live stream and there's something uh, else going on at the same time, you know how much I enjoy this because uh, right now the first four uh, in NCAA college basketball is about to start. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm huge into that. But I love this show, and uh, I wanted to uh, get our guest on tonight. We've got a little time change, so I did want to you know, respect his time, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, I guess, uh, get things going here uh, as quickly as possible because it's, uh, it's late at night uh, where he's at. We'll explain in a minute. Connor Brown here joining us live. Hey, Fef, good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thanks for joining in. If you're like Connor and uh, watching us live, feel free to you to use the uh, live chat. It's there, ready to go throughout the show. Feel free to ask questions, make comments, whatever you like. And if you're watching on replay, uh, please do leave a comment. Uh, remember to like the video. I do see them all and uh, look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, One thing I do want to mention is that Bowling with the Feff is brought to you by Chip Magnet Salsa. Chip Magnet is a company based in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, which is right near where I am. They distribute to stores in more than 38 states and Canada. Uh, You can find them online at chipmagnetsalsa.com. And uh, Bowling with the Feff viewers do have the chance uh, to get a discounted rate on chip magnet thanks to the folks over there you enter the promo code bwtf2024 at checkout you get 25 percent off your your purchase of 30 dollars or more on chipmagnetsalsa.com no limit there chip magnet raise your snack standards and thanks as always to the folks at chip magnet for supporting bowling and bowling with the fat flush in the pocket joining us hey derek good to see you there he's got a great show coming up later tonight 8 p.m um, I believe that's 8 Eastern, so it'll be 7 my time. He's uh, going to have EJ Tackett on. So uh, good to see. Uh, he's got a great show going on, and uh, looking forward to see what he has to say with EJ tonight. Well, our guest is the co-host of yet another uh, bowling live, uh, bowling YouTube channel, I should say. It is uh, the Spare Time Podcast which is part of his YouTube channel, uh, 10pin Ben. So to find it, you can go to youtube.com uh, slash at Ben Marston or search for 10pin Ben uh, in the search bar. You will find it there. Currently has more than 300 subscribers. And uh, he has almost 2,000 followers among the various social media platforms that he posts to and growing. Uh, as we speak. Ben Marston, uh, 16 years old, joining us from Sunderland, which is, if you're familiar with uh, with Europe, with uh, the UK, uh, it is at the northern part of the United Kingdom, about an hour from the border to Scotland. So uh, if I can get my stuff together here, let's get them out. Uh, pleasure always to have uh, Ben Marston here yeah. on Bowling with the Feth. Good evening to you, sir. Yeah, evening. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I, as you can tell, excited to be here. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited to have you. Uh, ben reached out to me, and we've kind of done a little collaboration here, where recently uh, I interviewed with Ben and his father, Nigel, on his show, and now we're kind of returning the favor. So it, it's great to have you here. Um, I want to start out uh, with my favorite part of the information that you sent about me, or about you, rather, uh, earlier today, actually. Uh, My favorite part is this line. When I'm older, I will become a professional bowler. I can remember being younger and thinking, boy, that would be neat to become. Maybe I'll become a professional bowler. You've got that confidence. Tell me about where that confidence comes from. Uh, It's it's a strange one. 
so I started bottom when I was seven. Mm-hmm. And obviously growing up, I mean, I filmed the podcast with my dad. I'm very, very close to my dad. Um, he's like, you know, on the PBA, you've got your, your, your roomie. He is like my roomie. You know, he, he takes me everywhere. We, we've got a, you know, a verbal agreement that when I make the PBA 10% or whatever I get, he gets. And it's, we work a lot on mindset. And I think I've spent best part of the past eight, nine years just bowling, bowling, bowling. And everything has been bowling, basically. And I've made sacrifices and all sorts to be bowl to you know to become professional and the the biggest thing that he always solidifies in my mind is no matter what if you try hard enough and you focus your undivided attention to something and give it everything you got there is no one in the world who has given everything they had at something and not actually achieved it and you know it's the saying that he, he literally tells me this every competition every time you know we're speaking about it, he says fake it so you make it if you can tell yourself in your mind that I'm going to be a professional bowler it's going to happen at one point it might happen I might go professional at 19 I might go professional at 25 but at some point I will go professional and it's one of those things of if you tell yourself that's going to happen my, my dad listens to you know my dad's I think 57 apologies if that's wrong but he's, he's, he's out there. so he spent the best part of like 30 40 years listening to so much mindset stuff and he says if you speak you know it into existence and you do it enough eventually your subconscious mind's gonna believe that that's what's going to happen so yeah that is fantastic advice, uh, really, for anybody doing anything, but certainly in the realm of bowling. And, and I mentioned to you before we started, that kind of gets me right in the heart because uh, my dad, who uh, you know has been gone for many, many years, was my bowling coach growing up. And he was the one motivating me and you know taking part in my bowling endeavors. So that was always special to me. And it's really cool to see that not only does he support you in the competition sense, but he takes the time to help you with that show. Is there any way to put words into how much that support means to you? Not really. I, I t- tell you what I can say. Um, he's my men. If anything, his he sort of self tells himself as my, as my mental coach and manager because when it comes to bowling, he's he, he's not great. Okay, so I think <laughs> we, we bowled a. Um, he t- he, so he, originally he he bowled about 20 30 years ago and he, he was all right and it, it was literally just going on sunday night for a few balls and whatever and um, his high school was 235 i believe it was okay and he always used to you know i used to get teased about it all the time and i'd bowl and i remember one one day i bowled a 234 and he goes you're still not as good as me though and then eventually I beat him, and now it's like, yeah, I'm better than you. And right. <laughs> he he hadn't bowled for about ten years, and then I started bowling, and he I, I bowled for maybe a year or two. I didn't even know he bowled at the time, and he was like, well, we'll give it a shot because he was after bowl, I think like Christmas doubles or something. He goes, yeah, I'll, I'll pull my bag out. So he pulls his blue ebonite ball out, and you know, this ball is like double my age. Okay. And he pulls that out. He bowls like a 191. He bowls for a few good games. He goes, yeah, I'm good at this. So we bowled in a league, a singles league, for about a season or two. He bowled and then he, he was all right, 130, 140, nothing you know, major. But that wasn't the best of centres anyway. And he took a year or two break. And I remember the pro shop, uh, my pro shop guy offered to coach him for a little bit. So... He drilled in two new balls. He drilled in a reactive ball. Um, I believe it was a hammer. I can't remember what it was, but it was an old ball. I'd never seen it before. Okay. So he drilled in this and a spare ball. And I always remember, I got I got a bit of jib off my pro shop guy because he turned around and my dad was throwing the spare ball as a strike ball. <laughs> and he got he got it mixed up. And he's like, well, you know, I know you want to win, but not that much. So nevertheless, that happened. And he, he took a year or two off because COVID happened. And then last season, he says, yeah, I want to bowl again. And obviously I bowl three or four leagues a week. And I go, you know, there's this league on a, on a first day. It's a doubles league. Let's bowl that. And he goes, yeah, let's, let's do that. So we bowled a season. And uh, needless to say, we finished bottom. Um, huh? I think we, we, we might have won about 12 out of 100 
we might have won about 12 games all season or something if we were lucky. Okay. And he averaged about 101. His handicap was higher than his average. So it was like he kind of just got bored of it and packed it in. But now he's just, I suppose, full time on me. And to be fair, like you said, I can't really put words to it. I mean, bowling, I compare it to motorsport a lot because my dad used to, he used to do karting when he was younger. And a big, big part of motorsport is you can be great, but if you ain't got the money, you're not going to go anywhere. And yeah. there's so many bowlers now who you look at and you go, especially in England, who go, you could be so, so good. You could do so many different things, but it's, I can't, I can't bowl these events and, you know, I, I can't afford it. My parents won't fund it. And I'm so lucky that my parents kind of went, this is what he's good at. Yeah. And this is what he, you know, he's dedicated to. And it's like, a, this is where you go this is going to be your going to be your life this is going to be your career and it's just been relentless i mean i get you know financial support you know they they take me to practice i mean my mum she you know she literally is like a taxi is what she says she takes me to and from practice like four or five times a week my dad takes me to competitions you know they pay they all you know they pay for it and yeah it's just i'm so lucky to have that because I know so many people have said to me, I wish I was in your position. And yeah. it's one of those things that, you know, when I get to the PBA and win a title, I'll repay it back to them. Yeah. Yeah. You you remember all the people that I introduced you to on this show when that happens, because I want I want the, the exclusive interview after uh, after you win that title. Um, First podcast. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so... Tell me about kind of the scene there that you're in, your bowling community, because, you know, you had asked me about um, some of the viewership of this show, uh, which I'm, you know, I don't think is even going out on a limb by saying that we're predominantly from the U.S. So I'm sure there's going to be people out there interested to know what is the bowling scene like in other parts of the world? And, you know, since that's your bread and butter there um tell us about what kind of you know what kind of centers you have how many you have around you and what it takes for you to you know to keep your skill up in the game bowl so uh I, a lot of the oldies are gonna like me saying this but my home <laughs> center is wood and mm -hmm. everything around me within a 20 mile radius is wood okay mm -hmm. and that's me and it's challenging but you kind of you know, you kind of, it's like, for example, sparing, okay? Mm -hmm. Your spare ball will hook on wood. Your spare ball's not going to hook on plastic. Right. So you've got to be accurate, which in a way it does help my spare game because I find sparing's a lot easier when I do go away. Okay. But in my area, I mean, the Eng England's very divided, north, south divide. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. And a lot of people, especially the southerners from England, think anything sort of, you know, Leeds and above doesn't exist. We have a bowling alley in, in Bradford, which is sort of and maybe an hour north of Manchester. And that's like, you know, they've got like the Kegel machines, you know, they've got, I think they've got Spectre, they've got all that. And there's no competitions any further farther north. I mean, there's one thing in two weeks' time, which is up here, but it's only really northern bowlers that go to it. And so a lot of southern bowlers just kind of go, kind of, think there's not much further north than that it's always like a little joke we have but around me i have three centers within 15 minute drive however the quality isn't really there i mean two one of them is like there's no leagues there because it's they basically ripped out half the lanes and put mini golf in and it you know it's one of those that's like a kind of like a family thing. entertainment center yeah, but it's literally in the town centre, so you kind of expect it. And that's why I used to bowl YBC, but then it shut down. Um, I think it went bust and then got bought out, and that's when all that happened, but we'd been moved away. And we've got another one, which is, it's wood, but, I mean, you being American, I'm sure you know what Guardian is. <laughs> I do, because we uh, had it at the centre here before they went synthetic. Yeah, we have, that one's got like 20 foot of Guardian on, and, Let's just say if you have more than 200 ever rate, you're pulling your hair out every time you bowl there. <laughs> yep. Um, and then we've got the one that I packed in the most, which is the one close to me, which is just wood. I think it's like 18 lanes. Like our biggest bowl now is like 22 lanes. Okay. Like 
So that's just up near me. We've got like one pro shop guy within two hours of us. Um, I mean, we get people from Scotland coming down to our pro shop because there's not really any pro shop operators like South Scot South in Scotland. And then for me, the closest, the, the issue I have, I mean, for Americans, it's like, you know, you can go two hours or three, four hours and you're in the same place. In England, you go three, four hours, you're in a, diff you're in a completely different culture, different accent, different everything. Um, like when I travel for competition, my closest one's probably two hours away. Is the close is the shortest distance I'll drive to an away competition. Okay. And you know all the sort of there's I'd say three or four bowling alleys that really have quality in England with like Specto or you know Kegel machines and you know good like good lanes, good facilities, are well maintained. Probably three or four of them. And the closest one to me is two hours south with like Kegel machines and stuff like that. Yeah. So, bowling, you know, the facilities we have is way, it's not great when it comes to bowling. Um, but I think if we're talking locally, like the people, I, you'll speak to a lot of people in England who will say that the youth bowling community is like non existent near enough nowadays. Mm. I think I was speaking to one of the guys that was, I think he's in his 30s now. And he said that you have a competition with 500 bowlers or something. And that was like, you know, the competition where now I think I don't quote me on this because I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I think someone told me there's only 500 registered youth bowlers in the UK oh. now. Wow. Or there's like, there's, there's I think cause we have like nationals, which is like a big event and it's over two weekends with maybe about 200 people each, you know, each day. So yeah. like each weekend so there's not much when it comes to that and a lot of it is going down south to bowl on synthetics like i can't practice on synthetic lanes because the closest synthetic center to me is two hours away and oh. obviously it's it's a distance yeah yeah so uh you've got uh some comments here uh derek says ben i would love to be on your podcast if he fits and he says check out his so again his is called flush in the pocket um sk uh says way big benny uh he says that's sam uh and uh says how much to get a reverse skin fade <laughs> can you let us in on what he means there <laughs> a reverse skin fade so basically like um, I mean, I haven't had a haircut in a while, but if you look here, it's where you have skin there, and it and it like it fades into like a haircut. Okay. What he means is go bald on the top and like get more hair down here. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, <laughs> how much? A three hundred game and ten grand, and I'll do it. Ah, there you go. <laughs> he says, "Don't diss the Southerners." <laughs> I'm guessing hey. he's one of them. I probably, yeah. Probably. And he said, cheeky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining us there, Sam. Uh, Caitlin K says, I vote reverse skin fade. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. I, I, posted, I posted the links to all my friends here. Okay, great. No, welcome to all of you. And, uh, yeah, do like Sam and Caitlin are doing. Let's, let's liven up that chat. Really appreciate that. Um so let's kind of talk about your bowling story. You mentioned you started when you were seven, um, but I think you almost have to start before that to get some context here, because although uh, you're in Sund Sunderland, uh, you're not originally from there. You've moved around a little, haven't you? Yeah, so we'll go, we'll go from when I was born. So originally, I was born in Germany. Uh, I was an army baby. It, you know... In the army, I don't really remember it because I was like, I think I we moved away from Germany when I was three, four. Okay. And then my mum got the um, moved to Cambridge for the army, whatever. She was there for about another year in Cambridge, and then she left after about twenty three years of service, I believe. Okay. And then my dad is from Sunderland, so we moved up here. Um, they stayed together for a while, and probably just after I started bowling, they both they got divorced. Or they broke up and got divorced. Um, so I've basically just lived up here with my mum for the past 10 years now-ish. I'm bored of, I'm 17 and four months, so it's about 10 years, maybe more. Maybe It's about that. I think we moved in 2011. 
Okay. I believe. Yeah. So, so you've been there quite a bit. Tell me about kind of the circumstances that first got you into our sport. So it was, I, I, yeah, so I, like you said, I was seven and I, I was I just, I don't remember where I was, but my mum said to me one day, oh, so-and-so, one of my friends at the time has wanted to go bowling. And I didn't really think what it was. I thought, oh, gonna, do you want to go bowling? It's like, yeah, we'll go bowling for like, whatever, fun. And it turned out to be like a youth bowling club. And I went and obviously everyone at the time most people in the club were like 16 17 sort of my age now and you know there's a few at the time that i joined there was a few really really good players that went on to play for england and stuff like that mm -hmm. so I, I i played for a few weeks and i was, I was probably rubbish and then might have bowled six might have bowled 70 or 80 but you know i i it was something new i enjoyed it so I was like, yeah, whatever, we'll play it. And I mean, I was probably like three foot two. So this ball's half the size of me. And I was just, you know, giving it all my might. And I, I loved, I, you know, I loved it. And I'm one of those people that, you know, I have, like, I have ADHD. So when you find something you like, you kind of just stick with it. And we went for about three more weeks. And my friend who originally invited me basically said, oh, well, I'm not great at this. I don't like it. So he, he quit. And I just kind of continued on for a while i think i i was not the best babe kid when i was like six or seven and you know i was quite angry all the time and i was a bit all over and my discipline was completely gone my mental game was like you know most people's mental game probably starts from zero mine was like negative 100 i mean <laughs> I, I i i missed i had one bad game in my consideration it was like well the rest of the tournament's done i mean you could ask my dad the same thing it was the first like if i bowled a competition and I was eight. If I say was averaging a hundred, if I bowled eighty-five, I'd literally lose lose it, and that was the rest of the competition done. I just wouldn't get better. Sure, and, and that's something we all improve over time. Um, oh, Caitlin says I will pay you all that's in my bank account, which is a large total of uh, a little more than a pound. So, I, I mean, maybe we could start like a GoFundMe for this. Yeah. <laughs> We'll, we'll, get get, the, we'll, we'll get a GoFundMe started. Yeah, there we go. Um, so you get started, and we all kind of go from just bowling to getting into some kind of organized program, perhaps getting in, getting some coaches. How did that uh, How did that start out for you? So obviously I joined the YBC, and there was two coaches at the time. I think it was Tracy, Michael, and uh, Pia. And, you know, they gave me a little bit of coaching and I was, you know, I, I bowled and we might have done the odd tournament every now and again. And I think my first tournament, my second tournament, I actually won. Oh. And I was like, oh, OK, that, that, that's that's cool. And I remember I was kind of sitting there and, you know, I bowled a few tournaments at this point and basically i was like well i quite enjoy this so let's keep doing it let's keep doing it and I, I you know as i got to about the ages of nine and ten i was bowling more my average was probably maybe 120 130 at this point and i was like you know i enjoy this and i think i've been bowling around you know i've been bowling about and i think it was about 10 i got to the under 12 masters um for like the btba which so it's like think of the PBA playoffs. Okay. You have the, you know, you have your points for the whole season. And then if you finish in a certain ranking, you move on and you can play like the masters or playoffs or whatever. Yeah. So I played that and I remember I lost in the final and I was, I was devastated. I, I remember crying like on the lane because I just, we both bowled terribly. Like the, the guy that I lost to I think, he he was he's a great bowler now he still is he was i think he was averaging about 170 180 for the day or something and i was probably averaging like 150 160 which was really good for me then yeah and i think i lost like 140 to 144 or something mm -hmm. it was like really really close so i remember you know i literally was all over and whatever so my dad being my dad he sort of tells me that if you're going to do something, you do it to be the best and you do it, you know, to go as far as you can do. 
and you kind of have that thing that you stick to and i really i was really enjoying it you know i was like i i wanted to go bowling all the time and it was i was looking forward to going and bowling these and we got i think i was probably about 10 and everyone still hated me because i was an absolute terror to to teach like I, my coach has given give me jib for it now it was like uh you know you were such a nightmare to teach because i, I literally wouldn't listen i just walk off the lanes and be like no i'm doing this i'm doing my own stuff and i i wouldn't take any advice and try to keep me on the lane was impossible and do you know what honestly respect and fair play to the people that coach me because if they didn't put up, if they didn't put up with me i don't think i'd still be bowling so yeah. We, we did that and my, my dad was sort of looked in at what can happen and my dad was like oh the pba exists so we spoke he spoke about it a little bit and i remember i was i was about the same age about 10 and he mentioned the pba and i, I wasn't really sure what it was and i was only young but the weber cup happened which um, do you know the weber cup yeah i do yeah so i went so my coach had mentioned about the Weber Cup and said that you know you should, you should come to the Weber Cup it's you know it's this thing so I think it was in Manchester or Barnsley or somewhere like that and I went I really enjoyed it and I was like you know this guy's bowling on the stage mm -hmm. and I think the lineups were like Martin Larson it, I think it was 2016 I don't remember the full lineups but I know Stu Williams Martin Larson was there Don Barrett um, PB3 was there. Mm -hmm um West Malot, all, all them type of people were there and I remember watching them bowling in front of a crowd of probably not even 100 maybe 200 it wasn't a big crowd but it was you know it's a good atmosphere and ever from there I was like this is amazing I want to I want to be that guy on the stage bowling and yeah. you know th there'll be a picture in the archives somewhere and my dad was like you know this could be a possibility and from there I was, I was hooked really yeah that's awesome. Um, and those are really, you talk about, you know, that number of years ago, these are guys in their prime. These are the, you know, the best in the world doing it as good as they've ever done. Um, Caitlin says, peep the shirts in the background. And, and you mentioned those before we went on. <laughs> they, they all have stories. So that one there is from the Storm Youth Championships in uh, Vegas. Okay. And then these two, that one was the one that I wore to Vegas and I, I water Vegas and that one that one is the one that I won my first ever um BTBA Masters in. Oh cool. That's great. So yeah, yeah only only the best shirts make it on that one. That's right. Uh Sam says, Ben, you're a muggy muggle. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> it's uh it's a Harry Potter reference, like the best oh, okay. it's not magic. Gotcha. Yeah, you said Harry Potter on the lanes. Yeah, magic. Yeah, for sure. Um, you are, you know, you are kind of getting your, you know, your skills are, are improving. You're you're starting to bowl more, I'm sure, and uh, you have, uh, you know, become part of the youth team England squad setup. Uh, what is that, and and how, you know, kind of fill in that gap for me between the time we're talking about with the big dreams and all that to being part uh, of this organization. Mm -hmm. So obviously as I got a bit better, my, um, you know, the PBA was like, this is more of a thing that we want to do. My dad was embedding it in my head. Um, you know, I flew to Ireland for the first time to play in a national competition. I remember I bought the last squad and I beat, and it was like under 12s or under 16s or something. I think it was. And I made the cut on low game or something. I'm I, I I all I remember is I I was six. I made the cut in sixteen. It was my first ever cut, and I made it by like the tiniest bit. And I was like, I was over the moon. And you know, so I, I bowled a bit. And as we got a bit older, I think I fell into eligibility, like age wise or whatever. For it used to be banned by the NAYBC. And you, it was basically you register at a competition and they go, do you want to be put down a bowl fit like to trial for England or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or something along those lines. I, I believe it was anyway. And, you know, as I got to about 13, 14, 15, it was, you know, I want I started wanting to try for England. And I was getting closer and closer. And I was like, oh, 
we should actually try for this now because I, I'm getting close. And I remember it was not this season, but last season, I got really close and I think it was for Triple Crown, which is a competition that consists of England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and now it's Iceland and Belgium as well, but it never used to be. Okay. And I missed out by one place. Oh. And I remember I missed out by one place. But I think that I think it got cancelled because of COVID anyway. So oh, okay. I don't th- I don't think I'm, I I think it did anyway. So it wasn't too bad. But that kind of lit a fire in me of like you know I wanna I wanna play for England. You know you see all the yeah you know, all the posts that are going around Facebook now. I mean they're off. I think the team England are now off the EYC next week, and you see it, and it kind of it kind of like triggered something. I'm like that's what that's what's happening, and. I bowled last season for, um, to try and get into Team England again. And there was like a quali- qualification period A and a qualification period B. And we'd finished the A1 and I had a horrible start to the season. I was coming off the back of my most successful ever season where I'd gone like 15 podiums in 15 events or something. And it was like, if I wasn't winning, I was sitting there thinking, oh, have I not won? Because... I was so it was like average divisions at the time, but it was taken from the average the season before. So I'd, for context, I'd gone to Vegas, and we learned so much from going to Vegas. Like my entire mindset shifted, and my average must have gone up by about 30, 40 pins. Because of the conditions out there, or because just, of something else. So, I mean, I was like starting this season. Where I, I, you know, I had three or four podiums the first few competitions. Like, you know, this is great. But I, you know, my dad wanted, we'd been to Ireland already and like, well, we want to go to America to sort of get my name out there and to see what it's like. So I remember I went and it was obviously SYC. That's like the demand for SYC. They sell out in like two minutes. Yeah. So we were like, okay, whatever. Um, It was 2022. So we, we tried and we, we managed to get in. And I remember like my dad was sitting there, you know, he had like Dr. Smallprint and he had like all of the paperwork and everything you'd ever need ready for this. And he calls me up at like two minutes past seven and goes like, you're going to Vegas and stuff. And I'm like bouncing around the house <laughs> going like, oh man, I'm going to Vegas. And I remember get, get on the plane thinking, this will be easy. Like I'm having the best season of my life. Um, I'm winning at like basically every event. I'm like podiuming in every event that I'm playing at the moment. Bear in mind, I'm like third division in England. So I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I was probably, I was way ahead of myself. Yeah. And because, you know, I, I was doing good against people I was playing against, but I wasn't like beating everyone. I was beating like people that were in my average division. And I went to Vegas and I would have been 14 bowling. I think I was bowling 12 pound balls. It was my last ever competition bowl in 12 pound balls. And as I got there, it was in South Point. So we, we walked in and we're like looking at it. And, you know, there's grandstands and it's like nothing you've ever seen before. And I just couldn't believe that I was there. And it was it was so surreal. And I remember I got put on a pair with Brady McDonough, yeah. uh, Mateo Quintero, um, Daniel um, Rios. And one of my good, and now I'm now really good friends with him, um, Ernesto Reynoso. Okay. So I got put on a pair of them four guys, and it was like, you know, I think Brady was 13 at the time, and so was Mateo. And they're like, I'm nearly a year older than all of these guys. And then the division below me, and I'm like, if I bowl a 180 game, I'm sitting there thinking, what am I doing? Like, what a game. Right. And Brady's bagging in 230s, I'm sitting there thinking, what world is this? Yeah. Because I come from England where it was the comp the level of competition I was directly playing against wasn't necessarily very high. And then I came and got exposed to one, the oil conditions were way were, you know way harder. I mean, my rev rate was terrible. It was always it always was terrible as a one hander. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, this is mesmerizing. I think there was 32 in my division. And on a short part, I was 11. I'm thinking, these kids just must be a bracket ahead. And the rest are like my competition. I think <laughs> by the time we did medium and long, I was like 28 out of 32. And 
but the actual going there and seeing you know the live stream and meeting Jason Belmonte because Jason was there I remember like we were sitting in a restaurant at the time having breakfast and I'd spoken to Jason Belmonte on a, on a discord call where he was doing like a sort of a and a for example and I told him that I was going here or whatever and I didn't know I didn't even know he was going at the, at the time and so I went and I saw him and and he came down with breakfast. He was with Jim Callahan for breakfast. And my dad went, look who's just sat behind you. So I was like, who's that? <laughs> I go, Is that? He goes, yeah, it's Jason Momonti. So I'm sitting there thinking, I'm the presence of the best bowler in the world at the moment. I was yeah. like, oof. So my dad goes, just sit and wait. Wait till he finishes his food. And then when he gets up, go and ask him for a picture. So he did. So he asked him for a picture. I don't know if I said, I don't think I sent you the picture, but there's a picture yeah. of me and Jason um out there and obviously he did a QA after and I beat the queue because I didn't have to like queue because I got a picture of him there. Yeah. But you know I spoke to him and it was my first experience really meeting a professional bowler. And I mean he remembered that I spoke to him like a week or two before and it was you know we spoke to him whatever and I learned so much from that. But the whole event of going to America, traveling on a plane, I mean we stayed in the Venetian because it was right after it was as we were coming out of COVID, so we hadn't done anything for like two years. So my dad was like, we'll splash the cash a little bit. And, you know, it's Vegas. You got you to you gotta do it a bit lavish. Yep. So we stayed in the Venetian and whatever. We, we made a, two weeks of it or what, and we were there. And when I came back, the, I think I had a mindset shift of that's where I want to be. Cause I want to be there every week. I want to be in America. I want to be competing against the best and, Ever since then, my average absolutely shot up, and I had one of the best seasons I'd ever had. Wow! And that... from that, we we kind of learned that as much as people wouldn't think it does, going to like different countries and competing against competition that arguably is way above your level is so good for my development because every time we've gone somewhere, we've learned so much. But what we also learned is I seen a match my competition so i've never like been dead last i've always if i go to europe i'm always around where they're bowling so mm -hmm. it, it kind of just changed something in my head that's fantastic um all right so your your dad has been watching here uh oh, and, and he says <laughs> uh, first of all sam says ben can you show us your bowling muscles pretty please and, and dad follows it up with he doesn't have <laughs> any muscles. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a bit of a bicep, but that's about it. See? There you go. Those are muscles. That, that's, that's, that's all I have. <laughs> uh, your Not dad much. also later on says, what he hasn't said is that we bowled in team league and he fired me after three weeks. So then we yeah. get into justice for Nigel and a little hashtag there. <laughs> um, and he says he's still paying for it. <laughs> yeah. So basically, there was I bowled in a Tuesday league, and it was the first league, team league I bowled in. And we, I, I literally, this league is full of like seventy year olds. Most of them are seventy year olds, and especially in this team, mo like I think there was six or seven people in there, and four or five of them were over the age of like seventy. Okay. So I must have lowered the team age by about twenty years. <laughs> Um, and we, we were bowling, it was my second season bowling with them, and we were having a bit of an injury crisis because they like, you know, the knees went and he went, and then someone's like hip went, and then he needs a new knee, he needs a new hip, and then they're always injured. Yeah. So the team captain, Terry, says like, oh, you know, your dad played bowls, doesn't he? he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, new bowl. So I, I got him and said, oh, we want you to bowl. And he bowled three weeks for the team. And basically what happened was he didn't bowl well at all. I don't think we ever got a point when he played. And the team captain went, like, oh, you know, Ben, come here, like, sort of whatever. And he goes, there's another guy wanting, wanting to play for the team. But at the time, there was, like, a limit to, like, you could only have six players on a team. It was a trios tournament. It was a trios league. But you could only have six to a team. And he goes, but obviously we're on the limit. And, you know, you, you know whatever. He goes, do you mind asking your dad if he could, like, not bowl for us anymore? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, well, yeah. Yeah. It's like, but I, you know, it's just 
whatever, what, anything, like, you know, just, can you do it? Like, oh, I don't know what upset him or anything. I'm like, but I just tell him he's crap. I will just tell him he's rubbish. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I remember I, he picked me up that night and I was like, yeah, so um, Terry spoke to him and he's, he's asking if you can, um, if you can uh, not play for the team again. <laughs> Just, just not ball. Yeah. <laughs> he basically got kicked out of a handicap league. Oh my gosh! Three games. And, and see now he's now he's getting his just desserts. Let me find my magnifying glass as you put up your muscle there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Kate, okay. Caitlin says justice for Ben's hair and justice <laughs> for Ben's hairline. hairline. My hairline is my hairline is straight. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for the most part, it's straight. There's nothing wrong with his hairline. My, my look forehead at this, might look be this big. hairline. I mean, <laughs> yeah, my forehead might be big, but I have a fringe for a reason. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, you let me know uh, that uh, as you're kind of developing your game and getting some coaching, uh, that a gentleman named Adam Cairns uh, has been working with you. So I had to reach out to Adam and uh, you know ask oh, him about you go. and your game. Uh, so he said that his involvement with you is uh, getting you more comfortable with your huge physical change going from one-handed to two-handed, uh, working on your position at the line and your hand position at release. Um, he said recently you guys have been discussing the mental game. Um, he also added that for someone who's only 16 in the UK, wanted to learn, grow, and strive to be the best, it is great to see. Um, and, and you told me that he's pretty accomplished. So tell me about what that means to you, uh, you know, to, to hear that kind of stuff from Adam. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not just him. So there's, I, I'm really, really fortunate for this. I basically have like, cause there's, there's not many bowlers in my area youth wise. Anyway, I mean, put it this way, we couldn't put a counting team together because there wasn't enough bowlers. Like we have like an under like, 16 or 22 counting there wasn't enough bowlers that were even interested in bowling this you know to do it so i have to bowl, bowl like you know try and compete for the for the adult counties but so i get coached by a guy called ant robson who's the pro shop operators andy robson's dad and because you know i have you know whatever they, they've obviously you know they sort of seen something in me or whatever whatever it is and you know they all chip in. I mean, Andy helped with my, with, you know, when I went two-handed, he was he helped set up my sparing system. And you know, Antful coach or Ant, for example, had like a knee replacement a couple of months ago, and Adam would step in and help bits there. And I think I'm really lucky to have these people who kind of are willing to invest their time into me and you know give me advice, give me help, and whatever. And I mean, Adam himself is. I've never met anyone who has a bad word to say about the guy. He just, he's always positive. I mean, I was speaking to my to my dad today on the phone, and I was, because he, he so and, and Adam recommended a book to me called um, Learn to Win. It's a, it's a golf book, but he said anything that's in there, change it to bowling. Um, by It's a, by a doctor something. Mm. The, the book's called Learn to Win. And I said, you know, it's probably going to need to take mental advice from him because if you ever see Adam frustrated or anything, and I'm like, I've bowled with this guy for like four years and I've never, ever seen him make a reaction about anything. Like he's just positive. He's, you know, he's positive. He's always calm. He helps everybody. I mean, he's just, you know, he, 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 I'm, you know, there's, he, he's one of those guys that are like, He's been about for a while, and he's he's bowled, you know, he's bowled on Team England. He's bowled, he's sponsored by DVA, you know. So there's all there's like what England, what we have in England, um, is the county that I bowl that I'm sort of I'm from and I bowl out of. They have for you for you think the size of the ink for the size of England. I think two or three years ago, I think four out. I think three out of the four players were from my from, were from my home centre that wow. played on the on the team England and you know so I've got this really really good support network of people who you know give me advice but I think you know in in the pro shop I spend quite a bit of time in the pro shop as well and I, I 
they they keep me humble. Um, is what we'll, was what we'll say. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they keep me grounded, and they're always willing to you know give me advice, help chip in. I mean, there's a video on my on my Instagram story of like Adam put a new skin on my finger because I, I hurt my finger today or something. It was you know stuff like that. So it's I'm lucky because you know like. As bad as it is for bowling in in my area, that there's not. I mean, there's you know, there's a few nine, ten year olds that you know, it's kind of too young. It, they're kind of too young to see if they could be anything good at the moment. Sure, but I mean, they're really committed. So I think in a few years there'll be some really really good bowlers coming out of where I'm from. Yeah, but you get- at the at the moment, there's not really anyone coming through. Um, my age, I mean, there's no one my age that bowls in like around me so because they see my aspirations and they see what i'm working towards they you know they give me the time and they they help me in you know whatever i need yeah that's that's awesome i mean it it always takes a village you know to make something like this i mean i had support when i was growing up through the game i'm sure you ask you know, the top pros and and they'll tell you the same. So that's awesome that, you know, you've got that support system. Um, like you said, um, so tell me about the channel. The channel is about nine years old already. And you have, I mean, it's really kind of made a, you know, kind of a, a, a right turn into podcast land, you know, in the last, uh, last several months. So, Kind of take us from the beginning. I mean, why you wanted to make the channel and how the Spare Time podcast was born. Okay, so the channel's nine years old, but if you if you you yeah, you've had a bit of research, my my oldest video is about a year old. Okay, okay. And the reason the reason being is when I was about seven. Subsequently, um, you know, we all went for that phase of I want to be a YouTuber. Mm-hmm. You know, so I, I remember like I was literally seven or eight sitting in front of a camera, waffling, like complete waffle about nothing. <laughs> and I, I I had the videos privated for like my reputation because I'd never lived some of the stuff that I, that, that happened on that channel down. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, you, I, I, my friend had a YouTube channel as well at the time. And, you know, you think you're going to do the next best thing. And I kind of had the, I got to about a hundred subscribers, but this is back, you know, this is nine years ago. This is, this was literally back in the day where you could post anything on YouTube and get views and subscribers because YouTube was so, it was nowhere near as popular as it is now. You could do literally anything and you're, you're getting us, you'll get, you're gaining subscribers and you're getting like two, 300 views a video for my like nothing. So, you know, that happened and I, I kind of took a break from that and probably got to about 12 deleted loads of my videos or whatever, start or like private them all. Then try to like, make a youtube channel again and took a bit more seriously the production was a bit better and but it was just like gaming videos or whatever and then i didn't really have any like you know I, like yeah i liked gaming but i didn't really have a passion for what i was doing so it was kind of i might have done a video once every six months and then it was whatever but it was kind of got the mick taken out me in school for it but i'm luckily i'm quite um what, what I suppose thick skinned, you could say. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of I got a lot of bowling as well. I got a lot of jib and a lot of sort of the mick taken out of me, especially when I was younger for bowling because in England it's like you know you've got your football players, you've got you know your rugby players or whatever, and then there's just me in the corner going, I play bowling, and they're like, <laughs> what's this way? Like this weirdo goes like bowling like four or five times a week, and like that's an old person sport. Like what's he doing? And hey. you know, you like all sorts of these comments, and I'm mm-hmm. glad that I kind of just didn't really care. And I, I must, I think it was the start of last season where I was like, you know what, I want to, I want to start a YouTube channel. I can't remember who start, who, sort of who inspired it. Maybe like I don't even know if Bad and Cow were posting then, but. It was it was one of those, and I was like, I want, I want to, you know, I want to vlog. Oh, I, that's what it was. It was great. So in America, the there's a few people who I, I don't think they do it anymore, but they used to vlog and they used to do all sorts. 
And I was like, well, you know, that's kind of cool. I want to do something like that. Or you see it in America, but there's nothing here. So I thought, we'll start the YouTube channel. But I thought, well, that's already there with uh, the 100 subscribers. Why start again when I can just use that one? Yeah. So, you know, I, I started uploading videos and vlogs. And my first vlog was counting trials, which I did this weekend. So my channel's probably, I've probably been uploading actively on the channel for about a year now. Okay. And like, well, whatever. I got some funny looks. I mean, no one else in England was ever recording or filming. And, you know, when you roll into a bowling center and you're speaking to a camera, they're thinking, what's that about? You got some funny <laughs> looks. But I was like, well, you know, I enjoy it. And I've got a passion for it. And I'm pretty good at editing videos and stuff like that. So why not? And then it was about August last year. I was sitting there. I was temping my podcast where he had Jason Bamonte on and there was an episode where the round table with like Parker Bone, EJ, Andrew Anderson. And I thought, this is sick. Yeah. And I sent him like, dad, like sort of maybe off the cusp when we were traveling once or twice. Don't you think starting a podcast would be cool or something? Like, yeah, maybe, but probably not. And it was like the look of like, well, I'm 15. Like no one's going to take me seriously or whatever. But I was like, okay. And then it got closer to the time and, we, we were like, well, maybe I should take it seriously. And one of my friends started a podcast to do with football. And so I asked him about it and he was like, you should just try it. So he thought, okay. Yeah. And then I was going to what's called a promotion tour in France. So we went there and Martin Larson was going to be there. And I thought, well, if we're going to start a podcast, we might as well start, you know, we might as well start like that. So literally was like, well, yeah, there's a picture. There he is. So I was literally <laughs> like, well, okay we'll chuck out an episode of me waffling um, <laughs> just to like say we have something and call it a podcast. Mm -hmm. And then we'll ask Martin if he wants to come on. So we asked Martin if he wanted to come on and you know, he's great. He came on and it was literally filmed in like in a restaurant, in a, in a hotel restaurant and you can hear plates cluttering and all sorts in the background. And, <laughs> you know, I, I bought like my laptop and webcam or whatever, and just chuck some stuff together and we recorded it. And then I was like, well, how, how are we going to do this? Are we going to do it like every week or every other week? And I thought, well, every week, you know, is that's going to be hard. So it's like, so we decided on every other week. But then my issue was, no, I kind of want to do it every week because I enjoy doing it. And, you know, it's like, the, oh, well, there's nothing coming out for a while. And it's, you know, it's one of those. But when we were talking about how we're going to start a podcast, I'm thinking, well, what, what, you know, I want to start a podcast, but I don't really have a clue what to do or what, what the crack is. Um, I was like, well, Okay. <laughs> not a bad boat, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, we'll, we'll we'll try it and we'll see what happens. And I'm thinking, well, what can we do that other people probably can't do? And I didn't really want to close it off to, you know, start talking technical or this and that. I didn't really want to close it off to people because ultimately you want to go to the sport as well. So I thought, well, my dad really doesn't have much of a clue about the technical aspect of bowling. So I suppose by having him on there, he can ask questions that are maybe – more open related or whatever yeah. you know it might be more friendly to just your average bowler who doesn't bowl you know competitively or whatever or people who don't understand as much because he didn't and also i'm very very close with my dad and we travel a lot and we're like we're we're, we're trouble whenever we get here we like we mess about and we just we're like two we're like two big kids yeah. whenever whenever we travel and it's a great dynamic and we feel well Let's bring the energy and make it in a podcast. It's a bit of something unique that most people can't do, so let's try it. And well, now we've just been going for like two, for like nearly, I think four or five months now, and it's just the power of social media and just messaging people. You never know who can yeah. say yes. I remember, obviously, Martin said yes, and then we were like, well, we'll message people and they'll say yes. And yeah, you know, it's amazing what reaching out to someone can do. Mm -hmm. And doesn't that show you, you know, really the the incredible level of access that you have to the best in this sport? I mean, it's not like that in any other sport. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. I mean, you can't go like Manchester United and go, we want to interview Ashford because they've got agents and they've got mm -hmm. PR teams. And where bowlers are just, they're just, no, you know, Footballers are sort of alienated and like, oh, they're so kind of separated off from the rest of the world. But bowlers yeah. are just, they're just people. And 
even the best in the world, like Chisholm or Monty, they just, you know, they don't have mobs flashing them in the street and stuff. So, they, you know, they're just people that like bowling like you and I. And yeah. they, they were good at it. And ultimately, that's how they've made themselves a career. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of bowlers want to spread the sport of bowling and spread the word. So, you know, they're happy to do anything. And I think for me as well, I remember messaging Verity Cordial and a few other bowlers, like 14, 15, like Pete Weber, for example. I messaged Pete Weber. A lot of people don't really like Pete Weber or think he's, you know, ma massive ego or whatever. I messaged him and was like, I'm 14 or whatever. And I want to, you know, become a professional bowler and this is what's going to happen. Like, what advice can you give me? So, you know, he said like big, you know, huge paragraph and stuff. And it was me thinking, well, these bowlers are doing something that other people, that other bowlers aren't, because you know you see bowlers knocking in two hundreds all the time. But what sets this guy apart from this guy, and what, what's the difference? So you know, how can I have an excuse to speak to a bowler for an hour on a video chat mm -hmm. for put it on YouTube, and that's the excuse? Yeah. So basically, my I now have a podcast which is basically an excuse for me to get a bowler who I want to speak to and learn what they do differently to other people and why they're where they are and why other people aren't. Yeah. Benefits you just as much as it benefits the rest of us uh, in your audience. Um, I also reached out to uh, somebody that you've had on your show. Uh, he's also been on my show, uh, Nate Stubler, who's uh, been on television this year, um, and asked him what the experience was like uh, to be on the Spare Time podcast. He said that he thought it was awesome. Um, he said he found it really cool that you and your dad were hosting the show. Um, he said you can tell that he really does his research to ask great questions to allow the viewers to get a better understanding of who many of us pros are inside and outside of the bowling center. Um, and he said to be hosting a podcast at your age is really cool. He kind of went on to say that if it's me, I wouldn't be able to do that. I wouldn't have the nerve to do that at 16. So he really, you know, appreciates and, and respects your ability, not only to do it, but to be out there, you know, and, you know, on a regular basis doing that. Um, you know, Nate was, I mean, he was a phenomenal player in Illinois. He was a phenomenal college player. We're now starting to get to see him a little on tour here. Um, that had to be a great experience for you too, given what you said about, you know, wanting to know what makes these pros tick. Yeah. It's, I think that was the first episode of the new year. And I thought, well, I've done a few in England to grow my sort of viewer base in England. And mm -hmm. he literally first show of the year, he got on and, you know, it was his first TV show. And I'm thinking, well, he you know, bold and he, he made a good account of himself. So I was like, well, where better to start because you can't go straight for you know Anthony Simonson or Jason Ramondi because they're a little bit harder to reach. <laughs> so I thought, well, you know, why don't we get the people that are breaking through? You know, they're going to be easier to reach, but also they're going to have a story that hasn't been heard 50 times. I mean, as great as it is to get Jason Ramondi on and to get a, an EJ Tackett on, they've already been on 50 podcasts before. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you know, it's like a, you're a bit late to the gig. Because, uh, it, I mean, yeah, it's great to get them on, but people might not want to watch the podcast of a guy they've already seen six different podcasts of. Because ultimately, there's only so many questions you can ask someone. And it's probably something they've already heard before, where if someone like Nate, you know, he was kind of like an unknown entity where it says, you know, he'd been nominated for Rookie of the Year the season before, and he was just breaking on it as his first TV show. So my thought was, he deserves recognition for what he's done, but also it's going to be easier to contact him and, you know, to get on onto him. And then we can have a word and see what happens. But also as then he progresses and gets better in three or four years time, people are going to come back and he does great stuff. You know, it, when he wins his first championship or whatever, people are going to come back and want to see what happened and go, Oh, well, you know, this was him a few years ago. So I, I think it, it makes sense because, you know, especially when you're breaking through, 
the getting that attention is great. I mean, if someone texts me and goes, Oh, do you want to come on my podcast? I'd practically bite the hand off, you know, <laughs> because I myself I love speaking, so yeah. Well, I it's for that reason that I'm glad you're over there and I'm over here because my hands are, you know, <laughs> undamaged. Um, what what have you learned about, you know, maybe through the show? What have you learned about maybe yourself? Uh, you know, it's easy to see what you've learned about the bowlers because, you know, we hear that outwardly. But, you know, getting into the, st- the process of creating these shows, coming up with the questions, actually executing it and, and doing it with your dad. What I mean, what have you learned about yourself through all this? Um, getting my dad to pick a date with his three is very difficult. <laughs> like it is such a struggle sometimes. I mean, it's all right at the moment, but especially because he so he, he runs his own businesses. So he has a few different businesses, so he works a lot. And trying to get a date where he's free, I'm free, and that guy's free is it's a nightmare. Yeah. So it was you know that's one of the that's one of the first things I've learned, but also the people watch my stuff yeah and it's it's it sounds really stupid but you do the you do the stuff that you do and the thought of well yeah but no one's really gonna watch it or you know i'm never gonna really hear of it and then you'll have you'll be born in a competition or whatever and people will be like oh I, I saw your podcast or oh you're the kid that does the podcast and stuff and i'm like you watch it <laughs> and so yeah and I, me personally it's definitely it's kind of i in the past few in the past year or so i had like i had a rough time with bowling where i've not bowled great or i've not really won as much as i'd like to win and i've struggled with a lot of stuff i mean start of last season i nearly broke my back got moved up to 14 pounders and i missed the best part of a month or two months because i wasn't in the best shape that I probably should have been and you know it I've learned that it takes I mean I already knew it takes a lot to you know become a professional bowler but the actual work on and off the lanes as especially as you you speak to them and you learn about what they've had to overcome you, you kind of think to yourself that you know it's one of those things that you have to put everything into to, to succeed in it and you know i think it's kind of giving me that sort of spark of well i might not be bowling great at the moment or i might not be enjoying myself but then when you get a film or podcast with someone that you watched on tv growing up then it's it kind of keeps that spark of this is why i do this is why i bowl alive you know you, you look forward to it yeah for sure is there a goal it, you know do you have an ultimate goal with the show or the channel or anything like that um getting chased by money on the podcast would be nice <laughs> um i've struggled i've tried and failed you're gonna have to get in line <laughs> yeah so i i had an idea on how i was gonna get them on okay and it was a great idea and then it doesn't exist anymore and I'm I'm sorry. He... So basically, he has a he has a Discord server. Okay. And I was like, well, you know, he's, he's, he was quite active on there at one point, and I thought, oh, we could do that. Yeah. And then it turns out that it's not really. It was not. It's still there, but it's not really as active as it was. And I was uh... like, you know, we'll try this, we'll try that, and it's it's a lot harder to get a hold of him than it is. But sure. I don't really think I set a goal out to be honest with you. I mean kind of just enjoying the journey really yeah yeah um get a studio would be nice yeah um that logistically i don't really know how that would work um maybe in america but hey podcasts are still going in a few years when i when i move to america on the tour then might might buy myself a studio there you go <laughs> I, saw, I, saw a guy, I saw a guy who has um who who hosts a podcast at the back of a van maybe i'll do that okay there you go. This is really going off the rails here. I'm going to rent him out as a parrot trainer? 
Yeah. <laughs> Inside joke or? No, just joke. Basically, <laughs> um, he says I repeat. My my dad always nagged me because he says <laughs> I repeat myself a lot. So ah, uh, okay. <laughs> he's, he's, take, he's taking the mic, but you know, me and my dad just take the mic out of each other all the time, and yeah, it's a great dynamic. Yeah. That's that's really cool though that you have that kind of relationship and that kind of bond. Um, so let's kind of get you know wrap this thing up. I know it's late there, um, and uh, you know that I kind of ask everybody to uh, you know to go off the sheet with me in this show, and that means challenging somebody else. It doesn't matter you know the skill level or anything like that. We look for people who are passionate about the sport and have a unique story to tell, which, of course, we all do. Um, so, Ben Marston, who would you like to challenge to be on a future episode of Bowling with the Fat? I thought about this hard, and it's a guy that's coming on my podcast soon, or at least he will be. Um, he bowls in England. He's called Callum Peach, and he, he, he's, he's literally in two or three days flying to EYC. He's, oh. one of the, you know, he's about a year older than me. He's one of the best youth bowlers in England, and he has a story that I'll let him explain. Um, but you, you'll you'll get the gist once you speak to him. But it's a really against all odds story. Like to be where he is now, you wouldn't expect it when you hear a story. And he's basically gone against what everyone's told him and got you know got to where he where he is now. Yeah. That's that's awesome. And Colin, if you're watching this, either live or on replay, um, and you're interested in taking Ben up on his challenge, uh, just come find me. Uh, I'm Andrew Pfeffer on Facebook, or you can email me at bowlingwiththefeff at yahoo.com. We can certainly make that happen. Um, ben, tell us where we can find you. You're, you know, you're on the Facebook, you're on the Instagram. Of course you're on YouTube. I'll put up the banner again, uh, where people can find the, the spare time podcast. Uh, but where else can we find you on social media? Uh, so I have a website, um, 10 pin Um, basically Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, anywhere that is social or the anywhere that graces the internet um yeah it will be temp and ben on there or ben marston and um hopefully in a few years time you can find me on the pro tour as well yeah for sure no we we will be uh watching with bated breath for that and uh hoping that uh, you accomplish that goal which is like i said just incredible i i love that um there is uh, no live stream for us next week. See, Ben has been, you know, complimenting me on my consistency. And then I come on and say, eh, we're not going to live stream next week. But I'm actually making my first trip out to South Point, uh, the center that you mentioned uh, before for the uh, Open Championships. I got caught on with a team. Um, and the USBC Masters happens to be in town that same week. So you might see a little... Well, USBC Masters content on the channel. You have to uh, watch for that. Uh, but then uh, once I'm back uh, in Wisconsin, Tuesday, April 2nd, uh, we will be back at it with uh, Christopher Sosinski, a uh, talented junior and uh, you know a high school player who just came off a really nice run at the Wisconsin High School State Tournament near Green Bay. Uh, he's been a standout for Amro's team, and we'll get into his bowling story uh, back at the regular time, 7 p.m., on uh, April 2nd. Ben, it has been a pleasure getting to know you and your story. Continued success both on the YouTube front and on the lanes to uh, you and your father. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, having me on. It's been great. Uh, getting ridiculed by all my friends and my dad uh, <laughs> has also been great. Um, hopefully this isn't the last time you see me on a podcast. I um, hope not. So if anyone out there wants to invite me on your podcast, please do, because I'd love to chew your ear off for an hour. There you go. Yeah, please. And uh, if you need it, need the connection and you know where to reach me, I can certainly uh, get you hooked up with, with Ben for that. And uh, of course, thank you to everybody who uh, has been watching tonight. Always appreciate that. Uh, remember, if you're uh, looking for bowling content, you'll also find uh, a great show uh, tonight in Flush in the Pocket. Uh, 8 p.m. He's going to have EJ Tackett on. Uh, but other than that, have...